This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It's one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, so you must be watching Think Tech Hawaii, research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark, and every Monday at this time, we present some of the active research that's being conducted at the University of Hawaii. We bring in graduate students, we bring in research faculty members, as well as some of the guests coming to Hawaii, specifically to do research here in the islands. And my guest today is one of the graduate students. Erin Fitch is a graduate student in the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at UH Manoa. So welcome, Erin. Thank you for having me, Pete. Our show today is all about when hot lava interacts with water, right? Yes. That's a very interesting topic for Absolutely. a student to be involved in. Can you tell me a little bit about it as an introduction? Yeah, so it is a very interesting topic and very relevant to Hawaii. Um, I have been so interested in this topic that I've spent uh, the past five years studying it in my PhD. Um, so when lava interacts with water, like here in Hawaii, we have lava entering the ocean, it can interact explosively. Um, and it can be a, a potential hazard and important for um, the whole field of volcanology in general to understand better. Interesting, we've had several other people as guests on the show talking about various aspects of uh, volcano mm -hmm. ice interaction and that yeah. sort of thing. But uh, this is clearly one of the major topics at UH Manoa, in fact, we've got world volcanologists here. So um, let's take a, f a look at the first slide, if we may, and I think this will give our viewers a little bit better understanding of what kinds of uh, products or the, mm -hmm. the landforms which come up. So let's look at this. And this is presumably not of Hawaii, right? No, this is in Iceland. This is this is outside of the, uh, the capital of Iceland, Reykjavik. It's um, a cone. Um, built from repeated uh, lava water explosions as a lava flow entered a lake basin. And it's part of um, what's called the Rithalar rootless cone group. So this is just one of many cones. And you can see a city in the background. Is that Reykjavik? That's Reykjavik. That's yeah. Reykjavik. Mm -hmm. And the, in the foreground, the sort of the brownish cone, yeah. roughly how high is that? Oh, that is about 14 meters high. About 14 is, meters yeah. or about, about 14 40, 40 feet yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Well, of course, we're in Hawaii. And that you go to Iceland. Yeah. I mean, this is interesting. <laughs> from, you know, so you, you go halfway around the world to study yeah. a landform that we have here in Hawaii. It's not just a subsidized vacation. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so the reason why we wanted to go to Iceland to study this particular cone group is because um, the rootless cones um, that form from lava water explosions in Hawaii tend to form near the coastline when lava enters the ocean. And uh, it's not the only formation environment that you can have lava water explosions. So in order to adequately study this process fully, we needed to go to a place where lava water uh, explosions were initiated in a different kind of environment. So in Iceland, many of the rootless cones um, form when lava enters a lake basin. So this is a very specific um, environment to Iceland for the most part. And uh, you, know, you can build these, these cone fields of hundreds of rootless cones. Okay, uh, and obviously here in Hawaii, we don't have these uh, no, lake no. beds or anything like that. No. So, so that's why you would go to yes. Iceland. Is that the only place where you could find these sort of landforms? Um, it's not the only place. Um, but there are far more rootless cones in Iceland and Hawaii than anywhere else on the planet. Really? Yes. They're two very special locations for this process. And, and you and I know that Iceland has the same kind of rock chemistry. Yes. But what we're seeing is a different type of landscape produced by the same rock types that we yeah, have here. Exactly. Yeah. So we can study, um, we have a study site on the Big Island as well. And so because it is the same rock chemistry, we can directly compare those two study sites. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's take a look at the second slide because I think we'll get a much better feel. We're looking at the side of one of these cones, yes. correct? Yes. All right. And again, this is about 40 feet mm -hmm. high, something yeah. like that. So explain to the viewers what it is we're looking at. Yeah, so you can see um, different deposits built um, from repeated explosive events. So um, 
the, the very thick, uh, very hard looking layer at the very top is, um, was molten material that then uh, continued to, to merge, was it still hot when it landed, and flow. We call that a reamorphic flow. And you can see another layer that's similar um, a little ways below, about halfway through the cone. And in between these layers and below that middle layer are just separate deposits of um, these individual explosions. So a cone can be built from um, and hundreds of explosions, depending on the cone size. And, and the material at the bottom part of this image, it looks as if it's layers, so that's individual explosive events. Yes. And, and are they any different from, say, the, the cinder cones which we have here in mm -hmm. Hawaii, or would you be able to recognize the differences? Yes, there are distinct differences between um, the, the ejecta, the material that comes out of these explosions, uh, and tephra that builds cinder cones, for sure. So one of the main differences is the amount of gas bubbles inside of the ejecta is much smaller um, for rootless cones than cinder cones. Um, but, you know, in general, we, we can see that rootless cones are associated with the lava flow, whereas a cinder cone it's also much bigger, and it's not usually associated with a lava flow. Uh, in the so if you went and dug a section through mm -hmm. Diamond Head, not that we're suggesting that, of course, or some of the cones mm -hmm. on Mauna Kea on the Big Island, yeah. you would not see that same kind of layering or the, in detail mm. a geologist like yourself, she would find something that would say yeah. this has to have been interaction with water producing the explosion. We would still see layers. Um, but they have a different, they have different characteristics um, that I don't know if we have time to go into detail, but uh, definitely there are some di distinct But this differences. is what you would do a PhD on, the, the subtle differences, yes. right? So, yes, yes. Um, there are characteristics of these sorts mm -hmm. of eruptions which you can see. Yeah, and the work that we do, we definitely set aside part of our publications to, you know, compare rootless cones with Right. Um, you know, magmatic eruptions. All right, so we're going to give, give you a quiz now because I think <laughs> your third slide will actually show one of these uh, examples uh, up close and personal. So yeah. here we're seeing um, whole layers of, mm -hmm. of rock. Um, what sort of scale do we have here? Oh, this is um, probably about three feet of, of From top section. To mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and you can see this is a very beautiful example of um, that, that orange color is actually lake sediment um, that is, you know, being incorporated into this ejecta, whereas the gray is mostly fragments of lava. And um, 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 what, as a, a, a student, do you actually go and study? Do you measure the, the shapes or the sizes or oh, the gosh. density or? Uh, everything. Everything. So we go in and we delineate the, the layering and then we take representative samples. Sometimes up to a ton of material, we will sieve down to different sizes. And uh, that gives us a, a distribution of the different size material um, that's in each bed. And that can tell us about the ex explosivity of that, uh, that interaction. And then I also go in and I look at the, um, the shapes of the ejecta in order to try to understand the state of the lava at the time it fragmented, which can, can tell us about uh, not only the, the lava flow characteristics, but help us reconstruct the energetics of, of these explosions. So let's just back up a bit. You, you look at the size, and that's yes. what you're sieving uh -huh. just to find the, the coarse material from the find. Yes. Do you do this in just one locality, or...? No, we, uh, we sieve the really big stuff out in the field, um, which can take weeks of manual labor. Uh, and then we take a small portion of the finer material and bring it back to the lab and um, sieve that as well in fine detail, which can also take quite a while. And presumably, the coarser material lands closer to the vent, yeah. depending on how explosive the yeah. eruption was, right? so it's important for us to choose uh, the right site to samples. That can take yeah, some yeah, yeah. time as well. And, and then the shapes? Yeah. What, what can you learn from the shapes? So, um, you know, because it's a lava flow that's interacting with water explosively, uh, and lava flows have a molten core and a solid crust, um, those different uh, states of, of lava are going to fragment differently. And the amount of energy it takes to fragment material of different states 
is going to, to we're going to need to constrain that in order to understand the energetics of these explosions. So I go in and I look at a representative set of, of samples from each of these deposits and try to determine what was molten at the time it fragmented from the core mm -hmm. and what was from the crust of solid at the time of fragmentation. Do we have the same kind of feature with lava flows of different thicknesses, or mm -hmm. would a thin lava flow be easy to fragment compared to a thick one? Oh, example? that's a good point. Um, a thin lava flow may be more easy to fragment, but it also wouldn't uh, require as much pressure buildup. So these are ultimately steam explosions. Uh, Water uh, is vaporizing uh, yeah. and pressurized, and ultimately when that pressure is released, it can fragment this material that's lava. Uh, around it. And, and so, presumably a thinner lava flow would have a lower heat content. Exactly, that too. So it's less likely yeah. to... So there's a perfect balance of, great. you know, amount of lava and amount of water that needs to be met to create a really, you know, genuinely large explosion. Um, so that actually is what we're doing on the Big Island. We have a wonderful study site where we see some very energetic explosions, and that's helping I us. think we'll get to that oh, okay. in a couple of slides, but... <laughs> To put you on the spot again, let's mm. look at the next slide because this is another mm. one of your field photographs. Mm -hmm. I presume that the, the knife there isn't a, a, a six foot long lightsaber, so that's giving us the scale. Yeah. What do you learn on this image, which is another vertical section that mm. you did not understand from the previous uh. image? So in this image, we see um, very distinct differences in the uh, size of the ejecta in these deposits. So you can see that where the knife is is a very coarse grain deposit, um, very large pieces that were fragmented and, and make up that, that deposit. Whereas right underneath it is very fine grain. So the fine grained um, deposit was the result of a much more high energy explosion than the one above it. Uh, and the high energy would have distributed this material over a much larger area, yeah. so we don't know the context here, but mm. maybe this is further away from the explosions? Yeah, potentially. Potentially, potentially. something like that. And, and we're seeing at the extreme top right what looks to me like some of the original lava flows. So. This doesn't destroy the entire lava flow. Maybe no. you know, there's a sequence of events yeah. where the first flow Absolutely. Exploded. You can have um, lava flows burying um, this ejecta and then, you know, more explosive activity, uh, you know, creating more ejecta that lands on top of the flow. You can get this sort of interlayering sometimes of lava flows and this lava water explosion. Now, now is this a, a common occurrence in Iceland? You, you say that... I would say that it is a distinct feature that is, you know, has been seen to be associated with Icelandic volcanism because of the environmental conditions in which lava can flow into. These, uh, Iceland has a lot of sort of low-lying marshy areas uh, and lakes, which we don't really have in the same abundance in Hawaii. And in the first image, we mm -hmm. saw that these cones were actually quite close to Reykjavik. Yes. Um, they must be a, a, a natural hazard, much more so than this phenomenon here in Hawaii. Yeah, they can be. Um, so one of the most recent eruptions in Iceland, the Barthabunga eruption, um, generated massive lava flows. and. Some of them entered a stream basin, and there was some concern over whether or not this would initiate lava water explosion. So it's important for us to understand this process from a hazard standpoint. Right. Well, we're getting near to the break, Erin, but I think we should pick up on this sort of hazards mm -hmm. aspect of your work uh, in the second half of the show. So let me just remind our viewers, you are watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark, and my guest today is Erin Fitch, who is a graduate student in the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics at UH Manoa. And we'll be back in about a minute, so see you then. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Hello, my name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm co-host of Hawaii Food and Farmers Series. Think Tech is important to our community because it provides a platform for all the important issues in our society. For the first time, Think Tech Hawaii is participating in an online web-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to Think Tech will run only during the month of November, and you can help. 
please donate what you can so that Think Tech Hawaii can continue to raise public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming like mine. I've already made my donation and I look forward to yours. Please send in your tax deductible contribution by going to this website, thanksforthinktech.causevox.com. On behalf of the community enriched by Think Tech Hawaii's 30 plus weekly shows, thank you for your generosity. And welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis Mark, and my guest today is Erin Fitch, who is a graduate student in the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. Now, Erin, before the break, we were talking a little bit about the, the volcanology, but we then got into the point that this kind of eruption might actually be quite dangerous. It's fortunate that we don't have many examples here in Hawaii, but should individuals in Hawaii be concerned about this type of eruption? Yeah, they definitely, you know, should be aware and respectful of the boundaries that the, um, the National Park um, and the Hawaii Volcano Observatory um, puts in place for their safety when lava enters the ocean. Right, because we've got ongoing yeah. lava flows from the Pu'u'o vent which are right. entering the ocean and presumably that's mm -hmm. um, the, the prime example of where we might be seeing this sort of thing. Yeah, I've been out there myself and it's a beautiful sight to go see active lava flows and lava entering the ocean and sometimes you can see uh, lava water explosions, but again, it's important to be careful of those boundaries. Yeah. And to, to warn the viewers, you brought along another image or two uh, of Hawaii examples yeah. and the kinds of landscapes which could be doing. So here we've got uh, a few. Tell us where this is and what it is we're looking at. Oh, this is on the south flank of Mount Oloa, um, south of Ocean View Estate. So many of you guys um, probably familiar with this area. There's a, a road called Road to the Sea. Uh, it's a great fishing spot, but it's also the home of the um, Manuka Natural Area Reserve. And within the area reserve are these very large cones from high energy lava water explosions. So that hill uh, on the right-hand side in this mm -hmm. image, that's one of these mm -hmm. cones that's yeah. been produced as yes. the lava entered the ocean and presumably Mauna Loa as it produces bigger yes. lava flows. The lava flows came from Mauna Loa. And, and the lava flow itself is this dark area, mm -hmm. this wobbly-like area. Yes, that's correct. And I think we've got a second view of the, the same general area. I, and Aaron, is this one of your field areas? Do you yes. Go here? Yeah. Good. No, let's well. go back. <laughs> Not that slide. We should have a different slide. Well, let's, we'll, we'll hold off on the next one. Yeah. But these kinds of uh, eruptions are rare in Hawaii, but presumably they would primarily occur at the coastline. Yes, they would occur at the coastline because Hawaii doesn't really have uh, lake areas for lava to enter. Um, Hawaii uh, can produce quite energetic lava water explosions because the lava flows can sometimes, um, you know, enter the ocean at high volume and high speeds. And this can initiate this very, like, you know, energetic mixing of lava and water. Okay. So you go into the field quite often, mm -hmm. but you've been to Iceland. Mm -hmm. It must be fascinating. You know, the logistics of going from Hawaii to Iceland. What, what's it like to work in the field in Iceland? That's wonderful. Iceland's a really beautiful place. Um, one of the differences between Hawaii and Iceland is, you know, Iceland doesn't have the same kind of uh, vegetative cover that Hawaii has. Now, of course, on the coastal plain, you know, there are these expansive lava flow fields in Hawaii where you get to see all the geologic uh, materials right out in front of you. And in Iceland, it's even more stark, and it makes this really beautiful landscape to work in. But logistically, it's much more difficult. Um, it's more do, expensive do, to do, get do there. Do you camp? Do, uh, can you drive a vehicle sometimes. to your site? Well, or? we're fortunate that um, the two main study sites uh, in Iceland that have, uh, where rootless cones exist and have been studied uh, in detail have been either close to Reykjavik, so we could stay in Reykjavik and drive out 
or have been close to um, cabins uh, that have been set up for sheep herders historically. Oh. <laughs> um, so it's camping in a way. I have camped yeah. while doing field work in Iceland before because it's sometimes nice to, to get out there and rough it a bit. Uh, and then how long are you in the field? Because Iceland's cold during the winter yeah. months, for example. Can I really only do? get this short window in the summer to do work in Iceland. Um, so, you know, when you do work out there, it's usually all one big go. So when I when I went to Iceland, it was for about eight weeks. Really? Yeah. Um, and that's obviously in our summertime. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. June or July or somewhere yes, like that. Yes, yeah. I think it was in uh, July, maybe early August, late June, early August. Uh -huh. And um, it's a wonderful time of year to work and still can be quite cold and drizzly. Um, but, you know, it's important that all the work gets done in that one, you know, one go. So it is a little bit more stressful because you want to make sure you get everything you need. Here in Hawaii, you know, I'm on Oahu, study sites on Big Island. It's an hour flight. Easy, easy. It's a little, still uh, takes some logistical effort to get out there. It's a, uh, the Manu Kanar is uh, all off-road and very difficult uh, off-roading. So... Mm -hmm. Um, it still takes an effort, and when I'm doing field work out there, I do live in the field for usually a week or two at really? a time. But I do have the benefit of collecting samples and then bringing them back to the lab, analyzing them, and having that inform my next series of field work, which is one of the benefits of and doing work do in Hawaii. And do you do computer analysis of mm -hmm. the, the data, uh, you know, sort of, or is it yeah. m mainly the measurements which you're making and you're sort of plotting out maps? or? Uh, it depends on, on our, our goal. Uh, there is some computer analysis uh, of the data. I don't know if you really want to hear about that. It's quite boring. <laughs> but all part of the job. Yeah. It's a lot of data to wrangle. I make lots of observations in the lab, and it can take months. And getting all of that data together into a, a package and a story, being able to understand what's happening, can definitely take some time. A lot of discussions with other scientists, for sure. So, are it's, there a lot of people working on this kind of topic, or mm. is Hawaii one there of the rare places where it's... are more now than when I started. Uh -huh. So I think it's been really nice to be part of that wave. Um, I feel like here in Hawaii, we have the unique advantage of being right next to some of these wonderful studies. You're sites, in a hot so field, in other words. We're at the crest of the wave. Great, great. <laughs> well, uh, and as our viewers will have seen with the slight preview here, I understand that some of your work isn't just relevant for volcanic hazards here on Earth, right? Yeah. Um, if we can go to the next slide, the one we've already seen, um, we've had a number of guests come on uh, the show talking about volcanism on the other planets. So the, the next slide will show us, I hope, um, that we'll actually get some examples of the same kind of features that you study yes. in Iceland, but on planet Mars. Yeah. So. Here we go, Here we go. Uh, and the scale bar down in the bottom right, 250 meters, so yeah. 700 feet. Uh, what direction is the sun shining from here? We're looking at some <laughs> very odd objects. It looks as if it's from the, yeah. the right-hand side, so these are cones. Mm -hmm. These are cones, so uh, sometimes it's hard for your eyes to make out uh, in Mars imagery a cone shape. Sometimes it can almost look like a crater, so uh, sometimes you have to give it a moment for your eyes to adjust. But these are cones. This is a series of cones sitting on top of a uh, what I believe is a flood lava. And it likely covered the landscape fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and these cones are associated with that lava interacting with um, water in the, in the Mars regolith. So we could extrapolate extrapolate. The fact that you see the same kind of features on another planet, um, presumably Mars has a lower gravity, so these form more easily, or uh, you can produce larger cones you with can produce less larger explosive, cones. you know, initial explosive energy. And the, the actual thickness of the lava flows could be mm. perhaps a little bit Probably thicker. Probably thicker. Or yeah, like that. that's a good point. Yeah. And these look to be quite fresh cones, so mm -hmm. presumably we've had liquid water close to the surface of Mars, or can you use the occurrence of these cones to... That's still an ongoing uh, you know, area of research, for uh -huh. sure, trying to understand how long water, when available, 
can stay available at the surface or subsurface of Mars and how much was available in the past. But we at least know that there is ice, yeah. ice in the, the sur on the surface of Mars and within the surface substrate, and that when heated, this can um, volatilize or turn into a gas form. And if you have a gassed form, you can potentially have an explosion. Does it make any difference, the type of landform you see, if you have ice in the soil versus mm, not liquid really. Water. Not really. So it really doesn't um, because the, the lava is so hot compared to the water or ice that that melting of the ice into water doesn't, it's not that much of a difference okay, in temperature. So you can't use the, the cones mm. as a diagnostic landform. It has to be water close to the surface. Mm. It has to be. Now, th th this is a really detailed subject for your PhD. How did you get interested in this? You know, what, what, what did you do as an undergraduate, or why did you come to Hawaii? Well, I, I, I did geology as an undergraduate. I was mm -hmm. always interested in um, um, applied math as well. So I did a minor in mathematics with the hope that I would end up doing something like this. Uh -huh. um, but I actually got interested in rootless cones quite a while back um, and was interested in, in my uh, current advisor's past work. When I went to northern Mexico on a field trip, and there's a very large um, volcanic field called the Penacates Volcanic Field, and there's mm -hmm. lots of features in that field where, um, you know, volcanic processes have interacted with, with water, um, sometimes groundwater. Um, but what I was standing on was the side of a cinder cone looking down at lava flows, and uh, the instructor of the field course said, look, there's a there, this was a lake basin. There was a lake here in the past, and it's since dried up with climate change. And this is like way past, thousands of years ago. We're not talking recent climate change. But, um, but there was no lake there anymore, and there was not going to be a lake there next year or any time in the future. But yet, at the edge of that lake where the lava flow had entered the lake, you could see these tiny little cones. And those were rootless uh, cones. And that was the first time. I still have these old Polaroid photos yeah. of these rootless cones. And... I think for me it was fascinating because it was like um, having a time machine, um, be able to see that in the past there was water and there's not water now, but here's this construct that can help us understand. I started reading um, some of the papers that Sarah Fagens, who's also Who has the been on the show in the past, yes, had written, um, and I was very fascinated with um, how uh, you know we could see something on Earth that we could see on Mars. Even at that time, they'd identified rootless cones on Mars. And um, this was really fascinated by the process. And the more I read, the more I wanted to get involved and contacted her. And uh, she had some so funding. And, and then ultimately, I came here. We all hope you graduate next summer. Yes. <laughs> what, 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 do you, what do you do after that? Mm. Yeah, so it, 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 uh, is it natural hazards? Mm. Are you doing planetary work? Are you? Doing more field work in Iceland. What, well, there's the always plan? more more field work. Okay. I'll always be doing field work ah. until I can't get in the field yeah, anymore. Yeah. But um, there's always more work to be done. Uh, you never finish, uh, you know, on a subject during your PhD. So I've done a lot of field work, a lot of laboratory analysis, and um, I'm starting to do numerical modeling to try to understand the the energetics of these explosions. And there's more work to be done in the future. It so sounds as if you've got a project for your postdoctoral yes. fellowship soon, right? Yes, I do. So well, I'd like to continue this work. Sounds fascinating work, Owen. Unfortunately, we're getting towards the end of the show. So let me thank you again. Thank you. And remind the viewers, you have been watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I've been your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark, and my guest today has been Erin Fitch who is a graduate student in the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. So thanks for watching the show, and join us again next Monday at 1 o'clock for another Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. Goodbye for now.